everyone, this is Ray and welcome to Asian Filmist. And we're here at the end of 2017 and naturally I want to start and talk about my favorite Japanese films of 2017. Now the films I'm going to be talking about aren't necessarily the best films of 2017 but rather my favorite films. And also, you know, being a, a human being, I don't actually have the time to watch every single movie that come out in the theaters because one, you know, there is that thing called a full-time job and two it's pretty expensive to watch a movie here in Japan I mainly limit myself to either checking out the cinema on discount times or even just waiting till the DVD comes out or if the movie is available to stream on Netflix or Hulu but I did my best to watch as many films this year as I can so here I am to take a look back at 2017 and talk about my favorite films of the year. I'm gonna go back and talk about 10 films, but I also want to talk about three honorable mentions because honestly, it was pretty difficult organizing this list. Uh, with all the films I enjoyed this year, it was hard to narrow it down to just 10, but I wanted to talk about a few more on top of those films. So let's start with my honorable mentions. The first honorable mention I want to talk about is the movie called Kiseki, the Sobito of that day. It's directed by Kaneshige Atsushi and it stars Matsuzaka Tori and Suda Masaki. And Kiseki is the biopic of popular of J-pop band Green. I think fans of Green will definitely love the performances put on by the two leads in this movie. I myself was a fan of Green. I don't follow their music much nowadays, but I definitely did back when I was more of a fan of J-pop. But Kiseki is definitely a feel-good movie and has a lot of charming performances by the actors featured in it. And on top of that, all the actors featured, they actually sang the songs of Green. It, they didn't just lip sync to the already existing songs by Green. They actually did, you know, I guess, more or less, they made glorified covers of Green and they did a good job. The next honorable mention I want to talk about is this film called Mukoku, directed by Kumakiri Kazuyoshi, and it stars Ayano Go in what I think is probably one of his is better performances. Now, I think Ayano Go is a really good actor with a lot of range, but I think he really shows what he's capable of in this movie. This movie is uh, it's based on a novel and it's about this former kendo practitioner uh, who is trained very, who's trained by his very strict father. But one day during a practice session, he accidentally clobbers his dad on the head with his wooden sword and knocks him unconscious. So now he's a, he's basically a vegetable. And so Ayana Go's character kind of carries on with this guilt. And the way the story plays out, it makes for a really good, not underdog story, but a comeback story. It uses kendo, a sport, as kind of the tool that tells a story of how this guy comes back and reclaims his old life. The last honorable mention I want to say is called Teichi, Battle of Supreme High. It's directed by Nagai Akira and it stars Suda Masaki. And this, all, this is based off a of manga and it's a very unique story. You take a look at the trailer and the, and the posters and all you see is just a bunch of boys. I mean, like I think at first glance, it looked like some kind of shoujo manga adaptation just with the, with the sheer amount of good looking boys in it. But no, it's actually a comedy film and it takes place in the Showa era in this elite high school where its alumni have gone on to become successful politicians. But it kind of parodies off of the Japanese uh, political system in that all the students are kind of uh, representations of different types of politicians we see. And it, they're over exaggerated as you as they should be in a manga style story. And everyone is making alliances and backstabbing all for their personal game and it's extremely entertaining. And what I especially like about Teichi is that it features a lot of alumni of some of the Japanese superhero TV shows I like, namely Kamen Rider and Super Sentai. Obviously, Suda Masaki is a former Kamen Rider, but then he's accompanied by so many other heroes that fans like myself would just, would just experience sheer joy in seeing them come back to screen. All right, so those were my honorable mentions. Now, let's talk about my top 10 favorite Japanese films. At number 10, we have Birds Without Names directed by Shiraishi Kazuya and starring Aoi Yu. This movie is based off of a novel and it's a murder mystery thriller. And what I really like the most about Birds Without Names is Aoi Yu's performance. And it's basically about this girl. She has had more than one uh, extramarital affair. And she, she lives with this guy who's 
about 15 years older than she is. And he's kind of the ultimate friend in the friend zone that is. And one day she receives word that the man she used to date, who she considers her true love, has disappeared. And she thinks that her roommate might be involved in some way. And the story does a very good job of leading you through all these twists and turns in a very surreal kind of storytelling at times. I definitely recommend this movie if you're a fan of tearjerkers or just plain old depressing stories. Next at number nine is an anime movie by the name of The Night Is Short, Walk On Girl. And it's directed by Yoasa Masaaki, who's known for directing these very crazy freeform style of animated films. And some some films work for me, some films don't. Like if you ever seen the mindfuck of a movie Mind Game, you know, it, that was just utter madness. And this movie is pretty insane as well. However, if I felt it was more constrained and more consistent with this narrative than the, its predecessor, but it's still pretty wild. What attracted me to this movie at first it was the illustrations made by Nakamura Yusuke, who, you know, you can see his art on the poster, but if you're ever a fan of Japanese rock band Asian Kung Fu Generation, Nakamura is pretty much the guy who illustrates all their album art. And, you know, and luckily we get blessed with the music of Asian Kung Fu Generation in this movie as well. The story, you know, to put it simply, there's a lot of stuff going on in this story. It's really hard to, to talk about it in this short amount of time. It's basically about this guy trying to attract the attention of this girl in the same college in Kyoto. And he, he spends the whole entire night, what seems like an eternity for us as the viewers, but he goes through this one single night trying to get her attention. And he goes through these wild misadventures while he's trying to do so. And these wild misadventures are, of course, uh, highlighted with the animation style of Yuasa. If you want some wild and unique animated movies, this is one for you. Next, at number eight, is a movie called To Each His Own, directed by Narushima Izuru and starring Fukushi Sota and Kudo Asaka. And it's based off of a novel, which I think the story would sing to anyone who's just pinned down by their job and just depressed by their work environment. More specifically, the salaryman who, who you might see drunkenly occupy uh, the trains here in Japan. It's basically about this salaryman who's so depressed with his job that he starts to faint on the platform, and but as he is about to fall in front of a train, he's rescued by this guy with the, who speaks with his Kansai accent, and from that moment on, they become friends. And the story dives into themes such as, you know, obviously depression at the workplace, and even suicide. I think this movie does a very good job of balancing the dark themes that it's meant to explore, as well as keeping it lighthearted and feel good for the rest of us, so we don't leave the, the experience feeling depressed or sad. But this is definitely a film to watch if you've ever felt stressed or angered by your work environment. Next, at number seven, we have The Third Murder, the latest film directed by Koreeda Hirokazu, and this movie stars uh, Fukuyama Masaharu and Yakusho Koji and Hirose Suzu. This movie is meant to be a crime thriller, but I think given Koreeda's touch on the story, it comes out to be so much more. It's basically about a lawyer who d is tasked to defend this guy who obviously has three murders under his belt, and he's about to get sentenced to death. And as this lawyer and his client, as the relationship grows, as the trial uh, continues on and on, he starts to question all the facts and everything that he believes. And what I love about this film is how Koreeda can take two carrots and just dive deep into their psyches. And the, the way Yakusho Koji and Fukuyama Masaharu play off of each other, it really is the strength of this film. Now, the story, as a, as a thriller, I've seen a lot better movies. You know, coming out of this movie, I felt kind of disappointed when I would view it as a crime thriller, but the more I looked at it as a Korea the movie, the more I was happy and the more I was satisfied with this film. This is definitely a film to check out if you're a fan of Koreeda's previous works. Next, at number six, we have Survival Family, directed by Yaguchi Shinobu and starring Kohinato Fumio and Fukata Eri. Now, I don't know about you, but I love Yaguchi Shinobu's movies. Swing Girls, Water Boys, Wood Job, they're all vastly entertaining. And 
what I like about Yaguchi's movies, he does very well with a fish out of water trope. And that's essentially what this movie is as well. It's about this one family who lives in Tokyo. You know, they live, uh, the father is a salaryman, the wife is a housewife, the kids go to high school and they're pretty privileged. But then one day all over the world, uh, they experience a blackout and electricity just disappears. And you see the crumbling of human society. I think this may be one of Yaguchi's darker films. Granted, this is not a dark movie as a whole uh, with what you may consider a dark movie, but considering uh, but comparing go his other films previous to this, this is definitely one of his dark movies. But I think it's definitely one that still works. Alright guys, so we made it halfway through the list. Now we're at the top 5. So next at number 5 is Godzilla, Planet of the Monsters. It's an anime film directed by Shizuno Kobun and Seshita Hiroyuki. What I like about this movie, it's a different take of everything we've seen of Godzilla up to this point. You know, this definitely doesn't feel like a, a daikaiju movie, a giant monster movie, a guy in a rubber suit. This more feels like an anime, like a mecha anime movie, but everyone's fighting off against Godzilla. This movie apparently was released as part of a planned trilogy. The next movie is scheduled to come out in May and I'm really excited to come and to go and see it. And the story of Planet of the Monsters, it's about a band of humans who have uh, at first who have evacuated Earth because Godzilla and a whole bunch of giant monsters have appeared out of nowhere and taken over the planet. Well, they, the humans, they come back to reclaim their planet from Godzilla and they bring back all their heavy machinery and mecha and they're ready to do battle. And I think with this movie, despite the first half of the movie being pretty slow and all meant for universe building, uh, the last half of this movie is just non-stop action. But yeah, I was definitely pleased with Planet of the Monsters and I certainly look forward to its sequels in the near future. Next up at number four is Gintama. It's directed by Fukuda Yuichi and stars Oguri Shun and it's an ad adaptation of the anime and manga of the same name. Now I don't know if you know who Fukuda Yuichi is but if you've ever seen uh, Yoshihiko the parody series of Dragon Quest or even the hentai common movies. This is the guy who directed those works and his works are absolutely hilarious and I thought he was a perfect match to the perfect guy to direct a Gintama live action because the result you know it speaks for itself in my opinion. Gintama takes place in an alternate Edo period Japan in which uh, aliens have come over and taken over the planet. So we get a mix of not only samurai and would typically be featured in an Edo period story, but we also get some sci-fi elements as well, such as robots, machines, airships. And on top of that, we get a whole crew of insane and bizarre characters that I think are just gut busting and entertaining. And not only did the comedy work for me, but also the action. I think if, if you ever seen the action featured in Hentai Comedy, especially part two, I thought the action in the second movie was far superior than the first movie, but I thought the action in Gintama beat that. And so apparently a sequel to Gintama is scheduled to come out sometime in the next year. If it does, I definitely look forward to watching it and it's gonna feature the same team. Next at number three is March comes in like a lion and its sequel, March goes out like a lamb. This two part movie was directed by Otomo Keishi, the guy who directed the Rurouni Kenshin movies. And this duology stars Kamiki Ryunosuke, who was also in Rurouni Kenshin, or at least the last two movies. And this story is based off an anime and manga as well. And so the story centers on this high school student who also happens to be a professional shogi player. Shogi is uh, essentially Japanese chess. And he comes from a pretty damaged familial background. Both of his parents have died in an accident, so he gets adopted by his father's best friend. And his presence in this new family causes conflict with his adoptive father's kids. And that causes the family to essentially fall apart. And he befriends his three sisters, this other family, who kind of take him in to be their kind of pseudo brother. And they, they, they take him in as another family member. And suddenly he realizes how how it is to be as a part of a family again. The two films lead through many tear-jerking and emotional moments, and there are also many scenes of Shogi. Although I feel the scenes of Shogi, if you've never played Shogi before, it might be pretty hard to follow those particular games. Uh, they don't go too detailed to the point where the main focus of the story is Shogi, but it's definitely a main part of it. 
But if you don't understand Shogi, it does a really good job of catering to you as well. You can at least pay attention to the drama and the tension that's happening while everyone is playing. The story was well put together, and the performances were fantastic, and I definitely recommend this movie if you enjoy emotional stories with plenty of opportunities to make you cry. Next up at number two is Destiny, The Tale of Kamakura. It's directed by Yamazaki Takashi, the director of many of live action movies such as Parasite and also Always Sunset on Third Street. And just a little bit of trivia, Destiny is, an, is a live action adaptation of a manga of which the author is the creator of Always Sunset on Third Street. So aside from the Always trilogy, this is the second time, the second collaboration between uh, Yamazaki and the, this author. Destiny stars Sakai Masato and Takahata Mitsuki. And they play a newlywed couple, uh, an author and a housewife as they move into Kamakura, which is one of the oldest cities in Japan. It's one of the old capitals. So I'm not sure exactly when what time period the story takes place in. It seems like a uh, pretty old time. Everyone dresses as if it's pretty old in times. Uh, I don't, they don't really have any smartphones uh, present in the story. It really feels like they're trying to preserve this atmosphere that matches well with what Kamakura represents. Destiny is a fantasy story uh, because in this world, in this Kamakura, all these old, all these creatures roam the town freely. And when the wife sees one of these creatures for the first time, the husband is just like, oh, it's just a kappa. It's all right. You know, this is Kamakura. There's so many beasts and creatures roaming around this area and the wife just kind of accepts it like, oh, okay. That being said, Destiny features a lot of the best uh, special effects I've seen in Japanese movies in recent years and they need that to bring all these creatures to life. And I feel like the movie will definitely make you want to travel to Kamakura as it features many of the sites that you can see in that city and even features the very famous local train line Enoden. And Enoden plays a crucial part in the story. I won't say what for but it's definitely not just a background character. It's a predominant role in the story. And personally I live very close to Kamakura and seeing the sites that are featured in this movie, it made me really happy to see uh, my area of residence featured in the film. This movie is extremely entertaining and the couple featured in this movie is definitely an old fashioned couple, meaning that the wife pretty much does all the housework and the, kit and the cooking and the husband is the one who goes out and does work. But I think that's fine because everything in Kamakura is meant to look and feel old fashioned. And on top of that, the performances by the two leads are charming and they're extremely cute and heavily smile inducing. And I think just the performances by the two leads alone are enough to really make watching Destiny uh, a must do. Last, at number one, what could it be? Could it be one of the many anime manga adaptations that come out? Now, it's definitely not Full Metal Alchemist or JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Tokyo Ghoul. Those unfortunately didn't make this list. Number one is based off a novel. Uh, the movie is called Yuri Gokuro. It's directed by Kumazawa Naoto and it's based off of a novel uh, written by the same author as Birds Without Names, who I mentioned previously in this list. This movie stars Yoshitaka Yuriko, Matsuyama Kenichi, and Matsuzaka Tori. And the story is about this young guy, this young young restaurant owner, but uh, played by Matsuzaka Tori. And one day his fiance goes missing. And as he's kind of waiting for clues to surface, he searches through his sick father's study and finds this diary of this serial killer uh, in his closet. And he reads it and he can't help but continue to read it and he becomes engrossed in the writing. Of course, this serial killer is played by Yoshitaka Yuriko and so we get uh, in this story we get two stories going on at the same time and at first you're kind of wondering how, what do these stories how do these stories relate to each other but the way everything comes together in the end I thought the reveal was well earned however I advise not watching any of the trailers because they kind of give that little tidbit away so if you ever have a chance to watch this movie do so without watching the trailers but I really enjoyed the performances uh, by all three leads in the story and especially Matsuzaka Tori as he re as his character reads 
uh, continues to read the journal. His character goes into much darker territory as he's getting desperate to find his fiance. This movie uses a lot of serial images when telling its story and it does a very fine job at creating atmospheric scenes that just draw you in. Same with Birds Without Names. I definitely recommend this movie if you're a fan of tearjerkers and just overall depressing movies. This movie has plenty of those types of moments. So yeah, there it goes guys. Those were my top 10 favorite Japanese films of 2017. What were your favorites of the year? Let me know in the comment section below. And don't forget to leave a like in this video and subscribe to Asian Filmist so to join in more discussions and reviews about Asian film. You can follow Asian Filmist on Facebook and Twitter. And by all means, you can follow me on my personal Twitter at Raymaru555 if you want to hit me up and talk more about films. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you all in the next video. So happy, happy new year. Hope to catch you guys again in 2018. See you guys.